Okay, we've got a hot mic. I've got us recording here. And we're live in 17 seconds. I think this is working. Going out to several places at once. Periscope, LinkedIn. Hello, everyone. How are you going? I think I'm killing my computer now <laughs> with this stream. So I'm going to jump here to make my picture smaller. How are we going? Can you all see me? Can you all hear me? Shout out if you're watching on the streams. Okay. How are we going? We're live on Facebook. We're live on LinkedIn. We're live on a few platforms. I think it's all working. Good. Good, good, good. So I'm multi-streaming or I'm, I'm casting out to various locations. Hey, how you going? Thanks for the thumbs up on LinkedIn. I can bring your comments in from, from Facebook and YouTube, but I can't bring them in to other things. So I'm just, I'll just wait for a few people to jump on board. Do we get a few people watching? And then we will have a look at what we're going here. I thought we'd listen to the speech from the Reserve Bank Governor. Because why not? Why not? Ah, oh, this stream is chugging, isn't it? So can you all hear me? Are there no problems? Stream status is good. Okay, let me bring up the audio and we will start watching. Hello, we've got four people on Facebook. How are you going, guys? You comment I should be able to bring it up got it all linking if you hear the fan in the background it's a bit hot today <laughs> okay good morning everyone Rob okay so we will bring that in Okay, guys, let me just check. check one more thing, if it's actually working here. It's all a bit of a mission to get it up and running, everyone. Why hasn't this, why isn't this going up? Why isn't this going up? What's going on here? Oh, there we go. Why hasn't no. this? Why isn't this? Once again, I've done the same thing. It is, it is unlisted. Sorry to um, John, uh, Dujan. Sorry, mate. I'm just uh, having a few issues here on YouTube, getting it up and running. It's just all part of it. It's all good, mate. I'll get there. I'll get there. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Well, guys, I've got it going. I've got it streaming. I may be a bit delayed in how I'm going, but hopefully the audio is coming across fine. That's really all what you're here for. Um, we're just live now, and we are on Facebook. And here we go. So I'm streaming to Facebook. I'm streaming to YouTube. I'm using Restream to send it out to LinkedIn. 
I'm sending it out to Twitch, uh, DLive, and Periscope. <laughs> so I am really pushing my, you know, little MBN connection here to the limit, guys. Now, for those of you on Facebook and um, YouTube, you can submit a comment and I can make it appear up on the screen. That's really easy. For those of you doing linked or on LinkedIn or Twitter, if you use the hashtag Heiser says, then I can bring your comment up like this here. But I can't actually connect LinkedIn to it. I can see it here. Audio is fine. Video is like 480p. Yeah, okay. I'm afraid uh, we're going to have to put up with it for now, <laughs> guys. Okay, we've got a few people on Facebook now. And on YouTube. Okay. Hello, Ante. Welcome. So what I thought we'd do is we'd go through this, uh, just the lecture done by the, you know, Reserve Bank Governor, uh, Philip Lowe, this morning. And, you know, got myself a Stein of, <laughs> Stein of rum today. A little different, guys. So I'll crack that open when we get started. So thanks for all for joining me tonight. I thought if I'm going to watch this, why not do it as a stream, eh? Cheers with your stein of coffee or rum. Hey, Paul, welcome. Thanks for joining, mate. So what I'm doing is I'm also going to play this audio and I'll make sure it goes through. So let me know guys if I need to tweak the audio from the lecture because uh, I won't be reading through it and we'll go through some of the slides here when uh, the governor gets to it. Good morning everyone. Rob, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for the invitation to address uh, this year's summit. The summit's become an important, lands uh, an important fixture on the payments calendar in Australia. This is the third time I've had the privilege of joining you so thank you for inviting me back. A recurring theme across the summits has been the need to improve customer outcomes. And Rob, you just spoke about that uh, now. And I'm really pleased to see this theme be uh, continued to this year. This focus on customer outcomes aligns very closely with the focus of the Payment System Board. The Board wants to see a payment system that is innovative, dynamic, secure and competitive, and that serves the needs of all Australians. So we're, our, our interests are very closely aligned. Interestingly, this feels like it's preparation for the cash ban. Okay, Paul's telling me I've got a bit of an echo on LinkedIn. Uh, and John, yes, it is only for Australia, mate. You know, we haven't conquered the world. Hang on, I'm gonna fill that a bit and we'll see how that goes. Maybe I've got to put some headset in. Let's see here. Actually, can I? No, I don't think I can do that. We'll see how it goes. This means that the payment system needs to support Australia's digital economy. With the digital economy so important to Australia's economic uh, prosperity in the future, we need a payment system that's fit for purpose. We'll only fully capitalise on the fantastic opportunities that are out there in the digital economy if we have a payment system that works for the digital economy. The positive news is that over recent years we have made substantial progress and Rob, you talked about some of that progress. And in many ways Australia's payment system is now world's first class. However, in the fast moving world of payments, we all know things don't stand still. And there is That's a good point there, Blake. I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that. Customer outcomes, yes. I mean, who are the customers? some important areas that we still need to work on. In my remarks today, I'd like to do three things for you. First, talk about some of the progress that has been made over recent years. Second is to highlight a few of the areas where we'd like to see more progress, particularly around payments in the digital economy. And third, I'll highlight some of the questions that we'll explore in next year's review of the Payment System Regulation in Australia. So first, the progress we've made. Over recent years, there have been quite significant changes in the way that Australians make our payments. We now have greater choice than ever before. Payments are faster, and they're more flexible, and they have more data flow with the payment. Yes, but we're not going to have that choice for a lot longer. That's for sure. 
and Paul's saying to get onto the CEC people. Yes, I, I, uh, I need to organize an interview with some of them to have a chat, because um, I've met Robbie. We'll see. We'll see when I, get, when I get around to it. I've got an interview tomorrow, guys. So, you know, we've got more choice, more data, but soon we won't be able to use cash, will we? Yes. The launch of the new payments platform, the MPP, in early 2008 has been an important part of this journey. This new payments infrastructure allows consumers and businesses to make real-time, 24-7 payments that are data-rich and have simple addressing using the pay IDs. After the MPP was launched, it got off to a fairly slow start, but it's now hitting its stride. You can see that here. Monthly transaction values and volumes have both tripled over the past year. And in November, the platform processed an average of 1.1 million transactions a day, and that's worth around 1.1 billion a day. So it's really hitting its strides. As you can see in this next chart, the rate of take up of fast uh, retail payments in Australia it's a is a little quicker than in most other countries that have introduced fast payments. Now, ex I expect that we'll see a further pick up in usage of NPP once the CBA has delivered on core NPP functionality for all of its customers. So here we have the chart that he's referring to, uh, the NPP. You know, I expect we'll see further pick up in usage once the CBA BA has delivered on core NPP functionality for all its customers. So we're picking it up. We're faster than UK, Sweden, Denmark. So the world is going, it's going cashless, isn't it, guys? It seems to be it's going cashless. Um, definitely. Information loaded, uh, Jupkek is asking. Yeah, well, even when you, well, even when you get that interest-free period on your credit card, if you're tapping, that's all data, that's all marketing, that's all valuable. We can sell all of that. Um, Paul's asking how we get cash. How do I get cash out if we go digital? Oh, I'm sure someone will 3D print you a Bitcoin. <laughs> oh. The slow implementation by CBA has been disappointing, but we expect the required functionality to be available soon, and I think we'll see the network effects take hold once that happens. Aren't we all a bit concerned about this rollout of this, considering the number of issues we've had? just with, with uh, electronic transactions the last few days or weeks? All up, there are now 86 entities connected to the MPP, including 74 that are indirectly connected via direct MPP participant. There are at least six non-ADI fintechs that are using the MPP's capabilities to innovate and provide service to the customers. In addition, around 66 million individual Australian bank accounts are now able to make and receive MPP payments. So there's been real progress. Use of the pay ID service has also been growing and around 3.8 million pay IDs have been registered. Does anyone have a pay ID, guys? Has anyone got that? Was, didn't it come out in the media that there was potential for it to be hacked or some issues there? Um, you know what, I'm going to... Yeah, no, I've got to keep that going. Um, weren't there some issues with that? Let me know, because I never bothered getting it, because I thought, why do I need a pay ID? I've got a, you know, an account number. So, yeah, we'll see. So Mitchell is going, he's uh, paid his mortgage six, 260 in advance. If the economy, go, if the economy goes bad, uh, I don't know what the rest of your question is, mate, because he got cut off, but good on you. Good work. I'll raise a stein to that. You know? Good work, mate. So yes, yeah, anyone done the pay ID? Jupkek prefers anonymous transactions. He hasn't done it. Blake has done it. So yeah, I, I just never saw the point of it. So keep going. As I said last year, if you haven't already got a pay ID, I hope everyone in this room has. If you haven't, you should have one. And I also encourage you to ask other people for their pay IDs if you're making a payment to someone as an alternative to asking for their BSB and account number. If we all ask for people pay, people's pay IDs, the, the message will get around. Uh, I think we all know that using the pay ID is faster and simpler and less prone to mistakes than using a BSB and account number. One oh, no mistakes. It's all good. Blake's telling us pay ID registers your mobile number, your account. One can't take money out. It's generally sending out. Okay. 
Oh, and here we go. I've got a, a message on my Telegram from uh, PubTest. Um, okay, you know someone who implemented the PayID system. Yes, and he said it leaked people's names. We're just guessing a mobile number. I mean, why the hell would you want to link your, your bank account to your mobile phone? I mean, these things are disposable, aren't they? Yeah, and, and Jupe Cake is asking about the cash ban. Uh, <laughs> I've been, I've been, I think I've been going too far down this rabbit hole now. It's all just... Yeah, they don't. They want us. They want us doing cash, and they aren't being subtle about forcing it onto people. Yeah, you're right there, uh, Horizon. You're definitely right there. They want. They want people onto it to use it. Go, go, go. But I mean, he is talking to. This is is an industry associated with that. So, so yeah. A specific example of where the NPP is already bringing direct benefits to people is its use by the Australian government, supported by the banking arm of the RBA, to make emergency payments. There you go. You need to have it to get emergency payments. So they'll, when you're most vulnerable, then they'll force you to use this system. During the current terrible bushfires, the government has been able to make use of the NPP to make immediate payments to people at a time when they're most in need, whether that's on the weekend or at night after the bank is shut for the day. One other area of the payment system where we have seen significant progress is the take up of tap and go payments. Around 80% of point of sale transactions in Australia are now tap and go. That's a much higher share than in most other countries. This growth has been made possible by acquirers rolling out new technology in their terminals and by the willingness of us all to try something different. There's also been rapid take up of mobile payments, including through wearable devices. Paul's just let us know on LinkedIn that he's gotten Pay ID and no one's ever asked for it. He uses Beamit and it's instant. I, I'm not familiar with Beamit. I mean, I've got PayPal and they want they want to charge you extra to instantly process it. I mean, it's all a joke. The banks are just, you know, how how long does it take? It's just moving digital money around. It is instant, but I bet you they manually check it. Um. Baikal thinks it's a, a step towards RFID implants, or people will line up and get them made. It'll be convenient. They'll just they'll just put them in themselves. Don't worry about it. Don't don't think there's a big conspiracy to do it. People will want them. They'll want it's convenient. I don't want to be lazy, you know. So here we go. Progress has also been made on improving the safety of electronic payments, particularly in relation to fraud and card not present transactions. The rate of fraud, from my perspective, is still too high, but it has come down recently, as you can see in this chart. I'd like to particularly acknowledge the work that AuspayNet has done here to develop a framework to tackle fraud. The framework strengthens the authentication requirements for certain type of transactions, including through the use of multi-factor authentication. This will help reduce card not present fraud and support the continued growth of online commerce in Australia. As our electronic payment system continues to improve, we're seeing a further shift away from cash and checks. The RBA recently undertook the latest wave of our three-year survey of consumer uh, payments use. We're still processing the results, but ahead of releasing those results next year, I thought I'd show you the latest estimate of the use of cash, which is the dot on the right-hand side there. As expected, there's been a further trend decline in the use of cash in Australia with cash now accounting for just around a quarter of day-to-day -day transactions. So if cash is declining in the economy, why do we need to bother with a law to make it illegal? To make it illegal? You know? Why? <laughs> why? And Paul has just let us know on YouTube. You know, you know in the US you, can, you can't use tap and go unless you sign with an ID too. I don't trust anyone over there. Well, there you go. That's that's it. That's it. It might be good for you, so you're not stealing someone's card. I actually, when I was working at Woolies at a, as a service cashier, I would refuse people to make credit card payments if it wasn't their signature, and they looked shocked. I was one of the few people that actually checked it. Yeah. And Paul on LinkedIn is reminding us that money laundering is uh, with yeah is in the banking system. We don't care about that. Okay, so we'll keep going. Because remember, cash is going down, guys. See, look, I did the chart for them. The RBA will probably charge, you know, a couple hundred thousand to, to do that, that graph, won't they? 
And from what we can tell, most of these transactions are fairly small value payments. And given the other innovations that I just spoke about, I expect that this trend uh, will continue in future surveys. So the progress across these various fronts means that there is a positive story to be told about innovation in Australia's payment system. Before we hear the positive story, I need to acknowledge uh, Jamie's fantastic suggestion. We go back to the rum trade. Cheers. I'm having, I'm having a Bundy Lazy beer, beer at the moment, rum and dry. It's, it's, it's good. Not sponsored, but if you know anyone at Bundy, I'd love to be sponsored by Bundy. So I'm obviously ignoring the keto diet tonight, guys. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. As I said before, in many areas, we are now world class. At the same time, though, there are still some significant gaps and areas in the payment system that need addressing and that where progress is required to support the digital economy. And I'd like to talk about four of these areas. The first is further industry work to realise the full potential of the NPP, including its data-rich capabilities. The NPP infrastructure can help make electronic invoicing commonplace in Australia, and it can help invoices be paid on time. <laughs> Help invoices be paid on time. What bullshit that is. This just shows me he's never worked in, in the game, in construction at least. Invoices paid on time. Yep. Sure. Sure, guys. Yeah. That's all we need to do. We just need to accept this pay ID, guys, and our invoices will be paid on time. It'll be magic. The government will do it. The government will do it. Sure. Sure, I believe that. I'm, I'm just too old and sitting. I'm having some more rum. So if I am stuttering in my movement, I think it's actually my computer. It can also support like significant improvement too much. in business processes as more data moves with the payment. Real-time payment and posting of funds also enables some types of delivery versus payment so that the seller can confirm receipt of funds and be confident in delivering goods and services to the buyer. So there are fantastic opportunities out there. The layered architecture of the system was designed to promote competition and innovation in the development of new overlay services. Notwithstanding this, one of the consequences of the slower than promised rollout of the MPP by some of the major banks is that there has been less effort than expected to develop innovative functionality. We all know payment systems and networks and participants need to know that others will be ready to receive and use the network to get the network effects. Some banks have been reluctant to commit time and funding to support the development of new functionality, and others have been too slow to roll out their day one functionality. The slow rollout has reduced the incentive for fintechs and others to develop new ideas. So we have not yet benefited from the full network effects. The Payment System Board considered this issue as part of industry consultations on NPP access and functionality. We conducted a, a, um, a review jointly with the ACCC earlier this year. As part of oh, we've got a super chat from Dawn. Uh, Hubby spewing about his recent $15 charge for using Pay and Go. What? Bank idiot shouldn't charge for phone banking, ATMs, and now pay... You can't get charged for Pay and Go, you? really? Bugger. Thank you very much for the super chat. I feel sorry for your husband. That's terrible. <laughs> 15 bucks? Can you get charged for that? So, um... Ken? Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, is this the same NPP pay ID that was hacked? Yes, it is. Yes. It is. That he's, he's happy about of this review, we recommended that MPPA publish a roadmap and a timeline for additional functionality and it's agreed, that it's agreed to develop. The first roadmap was published back in October and NPPA also introduced a mandatory compliance framework. Under this framework, NPPA can designate core capabilities that MPP participants must support within a specified period of time with penalties for non-compliance. This is a welcome development supported by the Payment System Board. Oh, the Payment System Board, we have another one. We have another one. Hang on, there's a question here someone asked. Uh, who was it? 
Um, here we go, Horizon saying companies allow late payments so they can charge people late fees. Uh, I guess from bigger corps, they, they'll just auto-charge them. And um, it was, uh, it's hard if you're a small business charging late fees. Good, good luck trying it. I've tried. I've tried. One important element of the roadmap is the development of mandated payment service to support recurring and debt-like payments. This new service will allow account holders to establish and manage standing authorizations or consents for payments to be initiated from their account by third parties. This will provide convenience, transparency and security for recurring or subscription type payments and a range of other payments as well. Another development of the sorry, another element of the roadmap has been the potential to promote the digital economy is the development of MPP messaging standards for payroll, tax, superannuation and e-invoicing payments. Does this all just seem pretty, like, dated? None of this is, uh, okay, I mean, you already have all these other systems that can do it. You've even got crypto system, you've got PayPal that's offering all these things. Is Australia just behind the eight ball? The standards will define the specific data elements that must be included with these payment types and will support automation and straight through processing and we would expect financial institutions to be competing with each other to enable their customers to make use of these data-rich elements of the MPP. Less positively, there's still uncertainty about the future of the two remaining services that we had expected to be part of the initial suite of, overlay, of OSCO overlay services. These are the request to pay and payment with a document service. We understand that there are still challenges in securing committed project funding and priority uh, from NPP participants to move ahead here, even though BPAY has indicated that it's ready to complete the rollout. The RBA strongly supports the development of these additional NPP capabilities, which are likely to deliver significant value for businesses and for the broader community, for the customers that we all talk about. A second area where the Payment System Board would like to see further progress is the provision of portable digital identity services. Portable digital identity services. How do you all feel about that one before we hear the Governor's uh, speech on it, guys? How do you all feel about that one? <laughs> oh boy. Right, I, don't, I only have one can of rum for this, I need more. that allow Australians to securely prove who they are in the digital environment. Today our digital identity system in Australia is fragmented and siloed and that's resulted in a proliferation of industry credentials and passwords. This gives rise to security vulnerabilities and creates significant inconvenience for people and inefficiencies in the system which can undermine the development of Australia's digital economy. Australia's digital economy. They also generate compliance risks and other costs for financial institutions. So it's strongly in our interest to make progress here. Does anyone feel like this is going to become your digital, your ID, your digital ID, your online ID, and we're going to tell our, our great grandchildren, our grandchildren, of the days when you could sign into the internet. All you needed to do was plug in. You didn't need an ID. You didn't need to swipe a card. You didn't need to, you know, log in with your your DNA test or whatever, or your RFID chip. <laughs> am, I, am I reading too much into this? I mean, okay, sure, convenience, inefficiencies, but you can see the potential for this to be abused, particularly by an authoritarian state. It'll, it'll just come through as being convenient and easy, you know? Oh, yeah, maybe I'm overreacting, guys. I think it's fair to say that a number of other countries are well ahead of us in this area. Good. Let them be ahead of us. Let them be ahead of us. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's... it's... Oh, well, maybe, maybe the future will be like uh, cyberpunk. You know, that'll, that'll be, you know, dystopian. We need to pick our breed of dystopia. I think it's a priority to address. 
The Australian Payments Council has recognised the importance of this and has developed the Trust ID framework. The government's Digital Transformation Agency is also been working on a complementary framework which specifies how digital identity services will be used to access government services online. The challenge now is to build on these frameworks and develop a strong digital identity ecosystem in Australia with competing but interoperable digital identity services. Just think about this. We've got the cash ban, we've got all the restrictions on our speech, more and more. I'm disappointed that uh, Falua didn't get a court case. I would love to have seen the verdict for that. I understand why he didn't go with it, but it's I'm 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 not liking any of this. And it's all gonna it's all gonna slide through in just convenience. Just convenience. You know? I think it's in our interest that we do this. It's in the interests of the customers we want to serve. The rollout of open banking and the consumer data right will bring additional competition between financial service providers and a strong system of digital identity is likely to reduce the scope for identity fraud while providing convenient authentication as part of an open banking regime. A strong digital identity system in Australia would also open up new areas of digital commerce and help reduce online payments fraud. It will also help build trust in a wide range of online transactions. Building this trust is increasingly important as people spend more of their time and more of their money online. So the Payment System Board would like to see some concrete solutions developed here and, de and uh, developed and adopted in Australia. Tom makes a good point here. Sorry, sir. We did not clap loud enough at the recent talk by our dear leaders. We chose not to do business with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you're right there. Horizon saying it'll be like a social credit score. I can see it going to that. Uh, you know, it feels like it has that capacity. That's the potential for abuse here. That's the potential for abuse. So, yeah. I'll keep playing again. It's an important priority. A third area I'd like to see more progress is on reducing the cost of cross-border payments. For many people, the costs here are still too high and the payments are still too hard to make. This is another area it's important for us to address. It's an issue not just for Australians, but also for our neighbours as well. I recently chaired a meeting of the governors of the South Pacific Central Banks. And there I heard firsthand about the problems caused by the high cost of cross-border payments. I wonder why that is. I wonder why all these South Pacific nations are concerned with cross-border payments. I, I, I just wonder, you know? Here we go, Crunchy saying uh, he got the payout out of court because they would have lost. Um, yeah, I know, but I, I wanted a court ruling. You know, it would have been good to see, set some legal precedent. That, that's, that's why I, wa I wanted to see it. But I understand why it would have been a nightmare going through it for him and his family. You know? Not that I agree with everything he said. You know, there's big parts, <laughs> big issues I have with, with some of the things he put forward, but that's not really the point. You know, it's firing someone because you don't like what they're saying. Bloody hell. Why the whole ABC? Analysis by the World Bank indicates that the price of sending money from Australia has been consistently higher than the average price paid across the G20 economies. And a recent ACCC inquiry found that the prices for cross-border retail payment services are opaque in Australia. Customers are not always aware of the retail exchange rate that's being paid and the wholesale ex or, the, or they're not aware of the final amount of foreign currency that they're going to receive and there are also sometimes add-on fees. As part of the RBA's monitoring of the marketplace, our staff recently conducted a form of online shadow shopping exercise, exploring the price... Shadow shopping exercise. Okay, I'm... I... What's that? Oh, Paul said I need to get another beer. Yes, yeah, he did. Oh, well, I... I uh, give me two secs, guys. I'm going to run upstairs and grab another run. I've run out, okay? 
Give me one second, we'll get back to this. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Come on. It's Tuesday, guys. It's Tuesday. Okay. Let's head back to it. Pricing of international money, money transfer facilities by both banks and some of the non-bank uh, digital money transfer operators. The main results are summarised in this chart here. As you can see, there is a very wide range of prices across providers, and it really highlights the importance of shopping around and getting the best deal. Hang on, see so here, what we're going. Horizons knocked 100 points of social credit for me for drinking, but this is Australia. Now I'm drinking Bundy Rum, it's an Australian product, you now with aluminium that's still made in Australia for now, until the Greens get their way. So I think this is like this is like a thousand points plus, guys. Okay? Let me know in the comments what you think. And drink responsibly for those of you on, on LinkedIn. That's the well behaved. I had some LinkedIn trolls. And it's funny, even the trolls on LinkedIn are just so well behaved, it's hilarious. Um Jamie's going, Are you getting another rum? Yeah mate. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah, come on. It's Christmas period. It's meant to be happy. And I need the rums to listen to this. In nearly every case, the major banks are more expensive than the digital money transfer operators. For the major banks, the oh yeah, no, he's got a he's that's one hundred percent right there. The banks are insane. The banks are insane. Um, Gumby, if you know someone at Bundy, I would love a sponsorship deal there, guaranteed, <laughs> guaranteed. Um, we went to we went up to Bundaberg for the Monrepo to look at the turtles. It was awesome. It was awesome. Uh, Bundy is owned by a UK company. Ah, oh, well. Still, it supports some people in Bundaberg. So there you go. Yeah, there we go. I'll get back to playing this. The average markup over the wholesale exchange rate is around 5.5%. That's versus around 1% for the money transfer operators. The graph also illustrates why the cost of cross-border payments is such an issue for the South Pacific countries. The costs are noticeably higher in this area than for payments to most other countries. This is a particular problem as many people in the South Pacific rely on receiving remittances from family and friends in Australia and New Zealand. So Jamie's thinking he knows why I've got a hairy chest, probably true. It takes it from your, hair, your head, mate. So here the governor is saying, well, that's the problem. The South Pacific receives so many remittances from from Australia. Maybe there is a market there for, as Thomas was asking about, a Bitcoin reducing those costs. I actually invested in an ICO for a cross-border payment process, sell pay, and it it disappeared. It disappeared. Yeah, good old ICOs. In many cases, low-income people are paying very high fees. It's important we address this issue. As is evident from the graph, most digital money transfer operators do not provide services to the small South Pacific economies, which limits customers' choice of provider in those countries. In part, the high costs and the slow speed of international money transfers is the result of inefficiencies in the global correspondent banking process. Given these inefficiencies, it's understandable why some large fintech firms operating across borders see an opportunity here. Where people are being served poorly by existing arrangements as they are here, new solutions are likely to emerge with new technologies. So this represents a challenge to the traditional financial institutions to offer better services at lower cost to their customers while still meeting their AML and CTF requirements. Central banks also have a role to play here and the meetings that I go to in Basel, there's an increased focus on what the central banking community can do to reduce the cost of cross-border payments. 
One example of this is the introduction of standardised and richer payment messaging through globally through the adoption of the new ISO standard. The RBA is also working closely with the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and AUSTRAC, as well as the South Pacific Central Banks, to develop a regional framework to address Know Your Customer concerns that have limited competition and kept prices high in the region. The fourth area where we'd like to see more progress is improving the operational resilience of Australia's electronic payment system. Disrupt, sorry, disruptions to retail payments hurts both consumers and businesses. Given that many people now carry little or no cash in their wallet or purse, the reliability of electronic payment services has become critical to the smooth functioning of the Australian economy. Ryan has asked if PayID is a scheme designed and implemented by the government. I, well, I'll open it up to everyone. Is it designed by the government? We've got the board here that the Reserve Bank is referring to. Hang on, I will look that up. Um, it was behind PayID. .com.au. And look, look at the picture they've got here. They've got this. They got a fish, fish head there for pay ID. Um, what is what is this? I I want to know what it's what's behind it. NPP Australia Limited, all rights reserved. AID is operated by the new payment platform, which is managed by NPP Australia Limited. Whoever for privacy can pay it. Okay, so what's NPP Australia Limited? Pub is telling us that the Reserve Bank created it. So they have a company. So NPP Australia Limited. Hmm. What do you reckon, guys? Mutually owned by 13 organizations. Okay. Oh, well. Here you go. Here's who owns it. And you were wondering why I needed another rum for this, guys. You were wondering why I needed another rum. I mean, we can trust all of these organizations. All of them. Here you go. <laughs> so no. Nope. By the banks. You know the good guys. The banks. Let's keep going. Good question. Thank you. We understand that given the complexity of IT systems, some level of payment incidents and outages are likely to it's likely to be inevitable. But it is apparent from the data that we have that the frequency and the duration of retail payment outages have risen sharply over recent times. Given this, the RBA has been working with APRA and the industry to enhance data on retail payment outages to increase transparency around what's going on in this area. We hope this greater transparency around the reliability of these services will allow institutions to better benchmark their operational performance. Just before we go any further, I'll put a question there to everyone. Do any of you accept crypto in your business? I had one, one plaster I was doing some drawings for, and I, you know, we were negotiating the price in, in Bitcoin, but he was, uh, you know, it was too high. He'd rather pay me in cash because he just wanted to hoard his Bitcoin. Has anyone accepted it? Does anyone accept it? I'd be interested to know if people do. Because that, that's uh, essentially, I'd call it an, like an open source alternative to this. An open source alternative to this. Um, Michael is going for XRP. Uh, my only issue with XRP is it's central centralized. How's it any different to this thing? You know? That, that's my question there. It's still centralized. Wow. Okay, let's keep going. Keep going. I'll hit another rum. So these are the uh, four broad issues where we'd like to see further progress. The final thing that I'd like to do is to talk about the, uh, the Payment System Board's review of retail payments regulation next year. 
The review is intended to be wide ranging and to cover all aspects of the retail payments landscape and not just the RBA's existing card regulation. As the first step in the process, we released an issues paper a couple of weeks ago, and I hope you've had a chance to have a look at it. We've asked for submissions by the 31st of January. Oh, hang on, there we go. We need to look at that, people. That issues paper, okay. There's another one just to keep an eye on. Just checking, everyone's watching, let's see, we've got the live stream. Good, good, good. It's all going. If you're on Periscope, guys, I can't actually see you. <laughs> Maybe I'll, uh, I'll see if that's working over there. I'll open that one up. I'm literally streaming to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six platforms. <laughs> oh, that's not working. There's another one just to keep an eye on. Just checking. Everyone's watching. Let's see. We've got the live oh, yeah, We've got, got people watching on Periscope. Hello. Good. How you going? Cool. Going. If you... There we go. Okay, I'm back. Jamie, um, Mr. Heisen, now my sister feels like a Guinness. Guinness is good. Guinness is good. I used to be able to, in my younger days, and uh, for the children watching, I don't recommend doing this. I'd scull up one liter Steiner Guinness at the German club, the Bavarian there, catching up with my mates. But yeah. Can't anymore. I'm too old. There'll also be opportunities for many of you to meet with the RBA staff conducting the review. The review will cover a lot of ground including hopefully some of the issues that I just mentioned. There are, though, a few other questions that I'd like to highlight. The first of these is what can be done to further reduce the cost of electronic payments in Australia? Both the Productivity Commission and the Black Economy Task Force have called on us to examine this issue. The Productivity Commission, yeah, fantastic. The Black Economy Task Force, oh boy, they're organisations we all love. You all love. Let me know how the sound is going, guys. Is it all? Is the audio from uh, from the presentation? Is it all good? No echo. I think it's understandable why. As we move to a predominantly electronic world, the cost of electronic payments becomes a bigger issue for us all. The Payment System Board regulation of interchange fees and the surcharging framework, as well as our efforts to promote competition and encourage least cost routing, have all helped lower payments costs in Australia. They've all worked. At issue is how do we make further progress here? What balance of regulation and market forces are going to best deliver lower costs for Australian consumers and businesses? Relevant questions here that we'll be examining are whether interchange fees should be lowered further. How best to ensure that merchants can choose the payment rails that give them the best value for money? And whether restrictions relating to the no surcharge rules should be applied to uh, the buy now, pay later schemes? A second broad issue is what's the future of the cheque system? Cheque use in Australia has been declining sharply. As you can see, the number of cheques written fell by another 19% over the past year, and the value of cheques is down 30% over the past year, largely reflecting the transfer of um, real estate, the real estate industry has made to electronic property settlement. They wanted me, when I was handling the conveyancing for my mother's property, uh, to do it all through an electronic system. I said, go to hell, I'll do it by paper. <laughs> I didn't want to use some software system and sign up to all this crap. It still worked. Worked fine. I think as you can see from this graph, at some point it will be appropriate to wind up the check system in Australia. And that They're going to get rid of the check system, guys. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? Paul's letting me know no echo and sound is fine. Thank you very much, Paul, on LinkedIn. Checks are not worth the paper. Still. That point is getting closer. Before this happens, though, it's important that alternative payment methods are available for those who rely on cheques. Using the MPP infrastructure to develop new payment solutions is likely to help here, so I encourage you to think about how that can best be done. A third question is whether there is a case for some rationalisation of Australia's three domestically focused payment schemes. That's BPAY, FPOS and NPPA. 
A number of industry participants have indicated to us that they face significant and sometimes conflicting investment demands from the three different schemes. This raises the question of whether some consolidation or some form of coordination of investment priorities might be in the public interest. Just think about this, how they're talking about all of these systems and public interest and everything. And me as a business owner, very small, not much money. Um, and what am I using for my online service? PayPal. It's efficient, it's cheaper, I've got to pay a cost, but there's no upfront costs. Or BPay. It's, it's just nuts. You know, I was looking at these Australian options. They're not as good. Hang on, you sent me... Crunchy sent me a Discord message. I'll have a look at that, mate. I don't really have it open now. I've got too much running on my computer, I think. So yeah, I, none of this feels like innovation, does it? You know? S uh, Deco checks still going. Yeah, they're still going, mate. For big things, bank checks, really. But yeah. So we'll go. We'll keep going. Fourth and finally, what are the implications for the regulatory framework of technology changes, new entrants? and new business models. As we all know, the world of payments is moving quickly, with new technologies and new players offering solutions to long-standing problems. At the same time, though, expectations regarding security, resilience, functionality and privacy are continually rising, as you all know. Meeting these expectations can be challenging, but doing so is critical to building and maintaining the trust that lies at the heart of an effective modern payment system. The entry of non-financial firms into the payments market also raises new regulatory issues. As part of the review, it would be good to hear how the regulatory system can best encourage a dynamic and innovative payment system in Australia that fully supports the needs of its customers. So these are some of the many issues on our agenda, and we're looking forward to receiving your input over coming months. But for now, thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Thank you. Well, guys, before we go into the questions, what do you reckon? What do you think? Jupkek is saying they call the cash pan feel innovation. <laughs> oh. It does feel very controlling, doesn't it? Very controlling. Particularly when we know who's behind it now. Who owns it? Who owns it? Uh, Jupkek is asking, is negative usury a crime? Or isn't it a sin? Doesn't really add much value, does it? Okay, let's, keep, let's go with the Q&A, guys. So we have time for a couple of questions for the Governor to uh, officially wrap up his responsibilities, public responsibilities this year. Uh, oh, he's going on holiday here. James is just letting it know. It sounds like they're planning for a cashless system. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? It really does. You know? Um, so please just raise your hand, name and affiliation. Here we go, we've got one up here. Uh, Dr Lowe, it's James Ayres from the Australian Financial Re Re Review. I'm sorry, and I've got uh, two questions, if I may. Um, the first one on the, on the potential uh, consolidation there of um, BPAY, FPOS and the NPP. Um, I'm just wondering how any decision in that um, regard would be, would be governed, uh, given the close relationships between um, NPPA and the RBA. Does the RBA focus on the customer outcomes there or, or the benefits of particular schemes. And my second question, uh, Governor, if you might indulge me, is uh, slightly broader um, than payments, but does the Reserve Bank agree with Kenneth Haynes' opinion expressed yesterday that directors who fail to act on climate risk are neglecting their legal duties? Uh, your second question is way outside my lane, so I'm going to avoid that if you don't mind. Uh, on the first one, I think the, if there is a case for consolidation, and I don't think that case has um, yet been established, it may emerge, I don't see it being driven by the payment system board, it would be driven by the industry participants, 
Um, how that best takes place, I'm not, I, I, I don't really have a particularly strong view. I raise the issue, though, because many people, many of the institutions in this room say that there are competing and conflicting um, investment priorities, and sometimes that gets in the way of progress. Confe competing and conflicting investment priorities that get in the way of progress. Just dwell on that. Just dwell on that, guys. Hmm. So the high-level question is whether some consolidation would be in the public interest, and we've got an open mind about that, and we're, we're not going to drive it, but if the industry uh, would like to explore it, we'll be supportive of it. Uh, I want more crypto. <laughs> uh, I've, got a, I've actually got an interview tomorrow with one of the founders of Independent Reserve, a crypto exchange here in Australia. That'll be interesting, particularly after hearing all this. Any more questions? We have one over here. Tom's raising a good point here. It's in the bank's, the big bank's interest to encourage as much regulatory complexity as possible to discourage new players. Yeah, you're right on the money there, mate. Oh, and thank you as well for the the uh, Christmas super chat. I appreciate it. I don't know where you sent it because I didn't see it my name when I was watching, but thank you, mate. I, I got it. Thanks. But yeah, I agree with you there. It does feel like they want more complexity to, well, limit new players in the game. And Paul is swearing on LinkedIn, which is very naughty, Paul. You're not going to like that on LinkedIn. The crowd, there they're, they're much more well-behaved than, than YouTube or Facebook. Uh, Governor, if you indulge me as well, Michael Heath from Bloomberg News. Um, just... Uh, it's just our last chance to get hold of you. On the GDP on Thursday, I'm just wondering what you made of that, whether that's a real um, look in the rearview mirror and what you're seeing perhaps from um, liaison is looking a bit better in terms of consumption and retail and that sort of thing, or whether we're sort of still in the doldrums and 3Q GDP represents where we were at. Uh, well, I, I can't avoid this question by saying it's outside my lanes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the GDP outcome was uh, broadly in line with our expectations. Uh, growth of 1.7% during the year was what we had expected. Wow. That's the first time I've heard him say it was, it was within their expectations. Let me just bring up their wage chart that I keep showing all the time. I'll, how about I have this chart up while we listen to what he's saying? I think if the surprise was the, uh, the weakness in consumption growth. Uh, in the September quarter, households did get a boost in their disposable income. They got it from lower interest rates and the um, tax payments the government's been making. So the surprise was the consumers decided to save a fair ch a share of that, um, uh, that extra income. The evidence, though, over time is that if Australians have extra income, they spend a fair chunk of it. So I'm, I'm still confident that over time, uh, people will spend this extra income. This is why there are long and variable lags associated with monetary policy. We get the money today and it takes us time to adjust our spending plans. Uh, when interest rates come down, it takes, time to, uh, people, uh, takes people time to adjust their mortgage payments, but eventually they do that. And the evidence from all previous um, tax payments is that people do eventually spend a fair chunk of it. It's quite possible in the current environment that the spending's taking a bit longer. Many of us have got a high level of debt. Because people are paying off their mortgages and their loans and their credit cards. Or people are preparing. They're worried. That's the feeling I get. Maybe I'm watching and reading too much news, guys. It, probably too much debt. And we're using the opportunity of the extra income to pay down the debt. But eventually, when we do that, uh, I think we'll spend more of it. So, One problem there, mate. Mortgages are bloody high. <laughs> The weak uh, consumption growth was a bit of a surprise, but I don't think it has particular messages about the future. We have here, so uh, Lulu is saying, now we see why they're pushing the cash ban. Trap us in a digital bank big brother controls. Yep. And then we'll get that 1% transaction fee for every transaction. Yeah. Great, we have a question just at the side here. Dr. Lowe, Sophie Ellsworth from the Daily Telegraph. You talked today about um, the decline of cash. 
but we have seen um, in many cases customers still being charged significant surcharges and constant bank outages. Is there still always a place for cash in Australia because of situations like these? Okay, I'm going to pause and prepare myself for his answer, okay? It's, this is premix, guys. It's like 3.5%. It's nothing, so don't worry. Okay, ready? Here we go. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I feel like in the future, perhaps cash is going to be the payment instrument you use when kind of a disaster or a, happens or a, there's an, a failure of the electronic system. And I think most of us who use uh, tap and go payments all the time still carry some cash in our wallets or purses because you can't be 100% sure that uh, you're going to be able to use the electronic system. So uh, if, you, uh, if you look forward into the future, I think people are still going to want to hold some, some of the bank notes the Reserve Bank produces in their wallet or purse, just, just in case. Uh, it would be good if they didn't need to, if the whole... It'll be good if they didn't need to. It'll be good if they didn't need to. And Josh has a question for the Governor, how are you still employed? Well. I'm sure someone will ask him that next time. It will be good if they didn't need to. The system was kind of electronic. I think that would, in the end that's going to be a more effective solution for Australians. But um, while ever there are outages and there are high costs of electronic payments, people will always want to use cash. So I can see the end of the um, check system. I can't see the end of the cash system, though. OK, I think the last two questions will start here, if we can. So you, the microphone's Sorry, coming. Yep. Jackie Kalman from ANZ. I'm just wondering, you mentioned um, the mandated payment service, obviously the migration to ISO. Do you see that the direct entry system will need to be um, also an end date set for that? And if so, do you have an indicative time frame in mind for this? Uh, well, the direct entry system has really been the workhorse of uh, Australia's payment system, but it, um, it's outdated, isn't it? And, now, I'm fond of telling this story, so if you can indulge me telling me, um, I'll tell it one more time. You know when you send a message um, in the direct, you make a payment using the direct entry system, you've got 14 or 18 characters to kind of say your name and the invoice, and if you're like me, occasionally you run out of characters. The reason that it has only 14 or 18 characters is the original message length was 80 characters. And it was 80 characters because that's many hole, their holes were in the punch cards. So the workhorse of Australia's payment system is still constrained by the punch card. So it, it needs to be updated. We need to be able to send more than 14 or 18 characters with our payments. Uh, I think eventually that system will need to shut down. Uh, the Reserve Bank isn't going to drive it, uh, but I think the industry will um, have to think about that as part of its medium-term strategy, what happens to the direct entry system. We've got a much better system out there. It's faster, it's quicker, it's more convenient more secure, more modern message standing, so, standards. So, um, but it's not something that uh, we're going to, to um, drive, but I hope the industry does drive it. So Biber is saying that uh, the central banking is outdated. Well, we're seeing how it's all going, aren't we? I think I had a comment here. Yeah, we'll keep going. OK, one last quick question, which I promised the gentleman down here before. Uh, Governor Julian Blokowski from IT News. Just on outages and the data that's been collected there finally for a, in a consistent manner, is that going to be made public at an institutional level so that people can see the performance of institutions in terms of outages in the future? And just on the um, consolidation of the domestic schemes, um, it's a huge question, but I mean, who would be the umpire in? in such a scenario if there was to be a consolidation. It's great to throw it out to industry, but you know, there has to be some sort of regulation. Um, on, on the second one, um, I think the ACCC would have um, interest in the, um, the topic and so would the payment system board, but we don't see ourselves as being the umpire here. Um, if there were to be consolidation, I think we'd need to be able to demonstrate, the industry would need to demonstrate that it was in the public interest and it's quite possible that, that public interest case will emerge. On the transparency of uh, outages and the publication of the data, we're very keen to see that published at the individual institution level. 
we've done some consultation earlier in the year, and I think it's fair to say that not all institutions were enamoured by the idea of uh, publishing it at the institution level, but we think it's important. It's important for the public transparency and confidence in the system, and hopefully it allows institutions to benchmark themselves against other institutions. Uh, the process we're going through now is to work out what form of transparency, uh, what, what form that should take, uh, how do we provide data that's most meaningful to people. And we're still working through um, that with the industry, but over the course of the next six months, we'd hope to finalise that. Because as I said in response to um, one of the other questions, that it's really important that people have confidence in the electronic payment system. We've seen examples uh, through the course of this year where businesses have not been able to sell their goods and services because the electronic payment system went down and people didn't have enough cash in their wallets. So it's really important to our modern economy that the electronic payment system's working uh, well. Um, both APRA and the Reserve Bank have very strong interest in this. Um, if standards didn't improve, both uh, APRA and the Reserve Bank have the power to set standards in this area. I, I would hope that we wouldn't have to do that, but um, it's a possibility if things don't improve. Great. Look, I think we have to wrap it there. We're a little bit behind time, so I would like everyone to join me in thanking the Governor of the Reserve Bank, Philip Lowe, for speaking today. So there you have it, guys. What do you think about the payment ID and the whole, you know? I'll just, I'll just leave this here while we talk about it, about the payment ID and the system that the banks are proposing. How do you feel about it, guys? Some of the issues that he raised. I, I'm, I'm a lot more... I'm glad I listened to this, actually. I wasn't planning to. <laughs> I just thought I would. I'm really glad I did, because I'm quite worried about it now. And I'm happy I didn't sign up for that payment ID when it appeared on my thing. You know? Um, I'm just seeing some stuff here. Here we go. Did you, Florian, did you know Holden are caning Commodore finally? I reckon Holden sold it off or dead in two years. Uh, isn't Holden already out of the country? Um, Jupe doesn't want it. Uh, Lulu is saying get rid of banks. Donta, the Commonwealth of Australia is on the uh, Australian Stock Exchange. Yes, it's it's just the, well, it's for all the crap Australia does over in the US. There's a corporate entity there. Like when CSIRO was doing all these patent lawsuits. Lawyer's a soy boy. Well, yeah, he listens to his daughter and makes management decisions based on what a child tells him. I, I don't understand. I don't know, maybe I'm too old-fashioned to, to accept that. Um, what else do we have? Blake uses it to pay his mates at pubs and dinners. Don't you do, you know, rounds? Just drinks? Everyone does a round? And it's, you know, you gotta keep going? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Three questions permitted, at least one of them pre-approved. Paul is going um, Westpac fund child trafficking. Well, yeah. Because of their innovative cross-border bloody payment system. How can they ensure... You know, he's talking all about the payments to the Pacific Islanders, but how can they ensure the same thing isn't going to happen there with this? Rumpel is letting us know that free speech is already gone. Boom. Yeah, we barely had it here in Australia. That's why the Americans are so lucky with their constitution. That's really why they're so lucky. True, though, is saying gold conversation, perhaps. Just doing what technocrats want, it's pretty trendy. Yeah. Ray is going, if we are forced with a cash ban and crap like pay ID, then the banks will pay their fair shares when they're caught. Now, that, that's not how it works, mate. <laughs> it's only us plebs that cop it. John is suggesting peaceful disobedience like Gandhi. Well, yeah, I think so. 
Do you think Australians will do that? Do you think Australians would even be disobedient? That's the question I have. Particularly with our culture, so fragmented. I guess you can get a, people from a whole lot of different cultures can come together and are pissed off at this if we, we get the word out there. There's some universal things there that, that shoots across cultures that will piss people off. That's where you need to find unity. You know? Oh. I'm dropping my rums, guys. Well, I'll, I'll share with you a little story tonight, what happened. So Frederick, a little, little four-year-old boy, comes up to me and goes, Daddy, what scares you? What scares you? And I said, oh, I'm not scared of the dark. I'm not scared of monsters. There is one thing that scares me. It's the tax man. He comes and takes half of your things away from you. And he looked at me going, what? The tax man? That's, that's not real, Daddy. That's a monster. That's a monster. So now he's been walking around talking about the tax man like he's some monster that comes and steals all your possessions, you know, going around as a mythical evil creature. And he goes, it's okay, daddy. It's not real. It's just pretend. It's just pretend. So then I said, okay, watch. I'll show what the tax man does. And I took a shirt off him and I said, see, the tax man takes your shirt off your back. So I, I think that's Parenting 101. I want to make a series of children's books. Let me know what you reckon, guys. <laughs> Let me know what you reckon. Jordan's asking, uh, Heiser, do you think we'll get helicopter money like we did in 2008? I don't think so. Jordan, not with this government, uh, unless they get really desperate. I think we'll see QE once the cash ban goes down. I don't know if we'll get helicopter money, mate. I wouldn't count on it. If we would, the money will be so worthless by the time then anyway. Crunchy is saying, have you heard that China is going to be releasing a crypto money that's backed by gold? Uh, yes, I have. Um, oh, who's the guy on the Russian thing that always talks about it? Hang on, I'll look at YouTube. He does, what was it, the Schiff report? Um, one guy always talks about it, Crypto Nut. Not Schiff, Kaiser. Kaiser was talking about it. Yes, I have. We'll see if it happens. That's going to change the world. That's going to change. What would you buy? US dollars, Australian dollars, or the Chinese crypto backed by gold? Let, let us know in the comments, guys. Let's have a vote. Horizon, rising a libertarian, raising a libertarian child 101 by Florian, perhaps. Well, more, more so. Honestly, I wish, I wish pay as you go was gone and people had to pay their own tax. People got all their money and they actually had to pay their own bloody tax because most of Australians have not actually seen the money come in their account and then had to hand it over. You do that, you will change a civilization overnight. People will change the way they vote. They will, it will harden them much faster. Much faster. I think that's what needs to happen. Every single one of them. You know? Tax man is patriarchal. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, I should have said tax woman or tax person. Of course, it's civil servants. It probably is. Just checking how we're going. So we've got, uh, we've got a view on DLive. Fantastic. And... I don't know what these things are. I, I haven't used DLive once before, much. Got some people on LinkedIn. Hello to LinkedIn people. How you going? Facebook. G'day. Um, what else do we have here? All taxes should be paid in cash in low denomination bills. Yep. Tax. Breast implants and watch money pour in. <laughs> Whenever I'm down the Gold Coast and I have the radio on, it's always advertisements for cosmetic surgery and breast implants every bloody time. That's the Gold Coast. Yeah? That's the Gold Coast. The true, though, is letting us know. It's saying it's up to us to snap our families and friends out of being disconnected. Voters... Have an idea of what they're doing come election time. Yes, no, I agree with you. That's why I would argue to shift the window, regardless of who you vote for. I, I Honestly, I don't think any one party or group is the solution. I want a mixed parliament. I want the bastards to have to argue and make deals in parliament and work for it. I hate seeing that empty room when the cash ban voted came in. So yeah, discuss, about, discuss it over the barbecue. 
you know? Even when you're buying your 7-Eleven coffees like I do. Gosh, is going, I'd be happy to pay tax if it was spent more efficiently. People in Parliament stayed in budget hotels and fluid economy like the rest of us. One thing I would suggest, I would say our civilization is too big with regards to our taxation, the federal, federal government. It's too big, we're too far removed. I think there's a certain scale where you can still have a community connection, and then when it gets beyond that, it's, it's too far removed. I'd say even schooling should, have, should be at a local level, maybe at a council level even. Really bring it down so you could, you could pick the exact society you wanted to live in and move around there. Maybe. I've had a few drinks. <laughs> the slender, slender tax man. Oh, that's good. That's good. Be careful, though. Slender man's dangerous. Checking on some of the other streams. Tony's reminding us that we're working a third of the year for the tax man. Yep. <laughs> a good golly, Miss Lolly. Uh, 7 Eleven coffee is $1, and the beans. I actually did an Uber trip with a wholesaler. I drove him back when I did Uber ages ago, and he wholesales coffee beans, and they're the same ones at McDonald's go to 7 Eleven. They're actually quite good for a cappuccino. I've trained myself out of being a coffee snob. I can now drink the most rancid instant coffee like I could when I was a student again. That's why I like the Aldi stuff because it's cheap. But a buck, you can't go wrong with a buck. Gotta save money. Recession's coming, guys. You know? Thomas is reminding it's supposed to be a federation. Yes, maybe we need to get rid of it. Defederate. I don't know, though. Charlie's going when the government uh, government and left finally held account for its corruption. We need to decentralize and go back to regional areas and communities. Well, I think we need to have communities, don't we? How many of you know your neighbors? I know a few of them. We're getting old and boring. Paul agrees with me on 7-Eleven coffee. That's it. You get the $1 ones. You don't want to add all the taxes together, Tom. Thomas, you don't want to add it all together. It's, it's too depressing when you do. Who here is growing their own vegetables? Horizon asks. Herbs and spices. Probably not a bad idea. It's a good idea, actually. So here, Paul's telling us all that the Fox Hill police station flew the communist flag. Is that true? Did that actually happen? I'll look that. I'm going to do a search on that. Because I know Box Hill is a Chinese suburb. But I live in the Chinese suburb in Brisbane. There are a whole lot of people that hate the CCP. Oh, well, yep. Oh, shit. Anger as, uh, oh, come on. Good old Frank. I like his work. Okay. Yep, there you go. Officer who did that should be fired. Why the hell did they do that? That's just insane. Don't they know the human rights records of China? Not a good country. It's horrific. People want to get out of there. Just talk to anyone that does uh, Falun Gong here in Sunnybank. 
They're not fans. There's, there's still people standing on the side of the street warning people about the organ harvesting here. Oh, shit. They flew the flag higher than the Australian flag. There you go. There you go. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. You probably need to replace the Australian flag and fly the Eureka flag. Oh, I shouldn't say that. What's uh, Josh Hugh TV uh, for the YouTube purge? Um, I, I don't know about this purge. People are talking about it, but I'm not seeing it. If anything, YouTube is getting better with how they're reviewing stuff. I'm seeing when I have something in limited state, it gets reviewed very quick. Seems fine. You need to be strategic with how you title things and the way you use captions and just certain words that'll flag it. You've got to play the game with it. You gotta, at least that's what I'm thinking, because certain things, the content can get reviewed and passed, but it's certain ways you title stuff. <laughs> the CCP flag is as Australian as Arnott's Biscuits and Vegemite, yeah. Probably. The Eureka Rebellion 2 now. How can you unify uh, uh, people in Australia? That's the thing. I think people need to wake up. Be made more politically unaware. Charlie's saying the Jobs Network have three flags Israel, Aboriginal, and Australian. Oh. There you go. Paul, does that sound horrify the Australian Chinese? Yeah, well, yeah, it would. It would horrify you. It'd be horrific. Oh, Paul just warned me I have to watch my language on LinkedIn. Probably have to. <laughs> um, Crunchy is saying, also, if your channel isn't making enough money, they can shut it down. No, that's, that's not really true. It's so YouTube has the capacity to remove features that you don't use, that, they, that aren't financially viable for them to provide. Because you sign an agreement with them and they provide all these services to you and they need to have a mechanism to remove stuff without you being able to chase them up for it. There's stuff that I think you'd have like text appear everywhere and that's an example where they got rid of it. There's no re they want to keep people on YouTube. They want you watching it. They don't care. It costs them hardly anything to keep the content up there. So yeah, some people misinterpreted that and it probably was written a bit badly. It, it, they want they just want eyes on it because no matter what you're watching, you could head to something else and it makes them more money. So yeah, I, th I think it's just people are seeing what they want to see in some of the legal legal writing. You know, Josh, John is asking, can one nation deliver? Well, I think they've got some good people surrounding uh, Pauline. They've got Roberts and uh, they've got, uh, oh, what's his name? In, um, in one nation, New South Wales, I should know his name. Come on, pub, you know who I mean. <laughs> Tell me if you're still watching. Um, Oh, why do I forget these names? Why do I forget these names? I'm bringing up their website. Mark Latham. Mark Latham. So, you know, but I, I wouldn't put your hopes all in one party. You'll get, you'll get your heart broken if you do. You know, be strategic with how you vote. Mark Latham. Yes. Uh, thanks, Thomas. <laughs> he gave a really good speech. When he went in there. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Mark Latham. There we go. Checking LinkedIn. Got the restream going. So let me know, guys. Am I appearing? John's going. Paul Hansen has the common touch. Yeah, she does. She does. I think she's uh, she's grown a lot as a person, too, with her lived experience, particularly going to jail. You know? Horizon thinks they're controlled opposition. Oh, I, government can't even organize a, a entertainment at a strip club without getting caught. The media 
media use them as a straw man of the right. Yeah, they do. It's funny. They attack them all the time when they're not really that right in a lot of their policies. You know, that's the problem. So how are we going? Let me just check a few more things. Still on the run. So here we go. I mean, I learned something new tonight, guys, about this payment system. Charlie's asking me if I saw Pauline's speech about males the other day. No, I didn't. Was it good? I wouldn't be surprised if it isn't. It's the one thing I remember speaking to a gentleman handing out flyers for One Nation uh, that he was the only person talking about men's rights and particularly reforming the family law, family courts. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just disgusting, really. It really is. There we go. On. So I'm not getting anyone on Twitch or D Live. Maybe I'll drop the content down on those or the the upload because I think I'm. Oh, I need to get a new camera if I'm doing this level of streaming. Lauren is fairly safe. He doesn't go into politicized topics. Yeah, I behave. Well, I try to. I try to. Even even some of my more well, edgy topics where I'm talking about gang violence in Melbourne. That was limited, reviewed, and monetized. I was shocked. I was shocked. Ease up, Floro. Oh, you'll go blotto. Oh, you got to. It's Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> no trigger warning. The Overton window has moved to the left. Yes, and we need to teach people what the Overton window is. We need to teach them at least how to vote and talk about it. And we need to shift that bastard over to the right. Thomas is going, Pauline has been countering, uh, countering the common man-hating narratives lately. Yes. Oh, it's... I don't think I could work in a big corporate. I remember when I was, uh, Rachel and I were working for a lecturer at QT, and she was talking all this feminist crap, and I literally just laughed at her. <laughs> I couldn't understand it. I mean, you're kidding, right? You know, your genitals don't make a difference on where you work in the industry. You just put up with it. But Yeah. I, they had a, a Crystal Vision Award in construction, you know, for women in the construction industry, and I kept calling it the Vagina Awards. Because you just needed a vagina to go for that awards. You can imagine how often I got employed again by that lecturer. Megan, uh, midweek drinking, maybe we need an intervention. <laughs> What's wrong with me? It's, it's Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah, well, I went to the dentist yesterday. I've got to get some wisdoms taken out. It's not fun. That's happening next year. In your broom, there are no gangs in Melbourne. There are randomly arranged groups of law-avoiding persons. With the power of social media, you're probably right. They're not a technically technically a definition of a gang, but you know, you don't need to have all the old ways anymore, do you? How are we going here, guys? Hmm. Electra is a snowflake. Yeah, she was. She was nuts. A few of them were. We had one subject where we had to... It was all about ethics, and they were all green 
brainwashing hippies. And I completely just did a lecture where I, it was actually my first um, step into questioning the narrative that was put forward in university and in the media. And I kind of tore it all apart. You know, there were, I, I would argue that I'd put the position forward that you could ethically argue to design and implement a nuclear power station if you looked at the implications of it and had a, a justified position for it. Anything could be justified with regards to a moral framework if you developed an ethical compass. And I still got a seven for it. Then I was invited back to Tudor at the next year and they had some hippie take it over and oh, it, it just went into save the islanders because there was one, one student that was an islander from Tuvalu and they wanted to bring him and his people over to set up a, a village in the middle of Queensland and they were all excited about getting funding for this. And the funny thing is when I was tutoring that guy, he was one of my colleagues, I failed him because he didn't do enough work. Then I had to leave. I had to leave. The subject, I couldn't have, put up with it. Here we go. Um, talking about men's rights is what YouTube wants to remove from the platform. Well, no, they don't. They just can limit state it. They, put it. they don't monetize it. They don't want any monetization associated with it. And then they, they pretty much limit the exposure of it. Some people talking about men's rights, I find are, are probably too graphic for the content. You've got to think about YouTube. They want to, um, they want to advertise nappies on the content pretty much. And, and some other content create, pardon me, they're very graphic or they are making fun of particular people. Like they'll, they'll target them and uh, that will get them, get them done. Yeah, and uncommon. They want training to be only tab. Yeah, I mean, because men's rights is nothing really. Pol politics is nothing on YouTube, guys. You know, a guy wearing makeup makes them a fortune in ad revenue. That, that's what they want. That's what they want. I think people overestimate the impact they're having. Or compared to some of the other sectors. You know. So, I mean, if you look at what, what Sargon did, you know, how what he was saying, no wonder that got him kicked off certain platforms. He was, he was pushing the envelope. And there was another one I watched, um, a YouTuber who showed quite graphic footage of a, um, of a sex reassignment surgery. And the problem was they all thought he got kicked off, I think, YouTube or Patreon for that. But I suspect it was that he was, um, he was actually making fun of individual people and he showed pictures of them before and after and criticizing those people. So he's harassing particular people. I think that's where he got done, not showing surgery footage because that, that would just be limited. There, that is the, there's the difference. Um, so you've got to think about how they're, how they're interpreting it. And they also will take the comments if people are just making all horrific comments on it. They'll just can it there. Uh, Clean Your Broom is asking, can BitChute become a viable alternative if they sort a few technical issues? Uh, Computing Forever did a good video about it. He did a good video about it. I suggest you have a look at that. Um, and PubTest is sending me something on Telegram. Uh, this is Pauline Hansen's video. I'll have a look at that later, mate. Pauline Hansen's man speech. Is it an empty Senate chamber again? Will I be depressed? So have a look at Computing Forever's video. He's trying to get some help for the for BitChute. It's smaller than we thought. And uh, we'll see if it becomes a viable alternative. <laughs> I just got demonetized. Probably, probably. I'll just I'll press this ad button here and chuck an ad in the video. There we go. That'll make up for it. You know, even the limited state videos, you get these ads for um for like fight street fighting lessons and stuff that comes on. It's pretty weird. Interesting. This DP, your message, um, bit shoot is awesome. That was held for um. Isa, when you say when you see makeup on a man, what do you think about it? The only time I think men need makeup is when they're performing on stage and you need to see them from the audience as a professional requirement. I don't know any other reason. I, I, I'm, this may shock you, but I'm not the type of guy that puts on product. I remember I, there were builders, builders in the yard I'd go visit, and they were like putting gel and shit in their hair and product and all this stuff, and and I, I'd pay them out, going, "You're meant to be more masculine than me. I'm the, I'm the fruffy architect. Come on, guys." Yeah, I, I think it's a different generation, guys. I mean, they're selling you, they're getting you to buy more crap. You know, soap. 
That's what it does. Megan saying many channels have gone to BitChute. Yeah. I mean, I've got my BitChute channel. It's getting... I've kind of got the uploading a bit better. Uncommon is letting us see. Every single one of your comments that's mentioning BitChute is being put limited. You know why? Can someone write it without the word bitch at the front? Go B-I-T-U-T. Just put that in a comment. We'll see if that gets limited. Because I think that's the word. It's, see, this is the problem. They've only got dumb AI stuff. Yeah, I don't believe that, mate. I don't think if it's demonetized, they'll remove it. It's still view time. That's all they care about. They can always send someone else to other content. You can find some real, you know, completely inappropriate stuff on there. See, again, Jack's uh, comment was, uh, was taken. See, bit came in. Yeah, see? Yep, it's because the word uh, biatch isn't working. Oh, wait, stop streaming stuff, guys. Hang on. If you all start sh putting the same stuff on it, the AI filter will, will uh, ban accounts. So I can't get you to do it. It's funny. But it happens. See, all of those ones that I just appeared, they disappeared. So if you've if you got the word female dog, there you go. That's what it is. So it's wordplay, guys. You've got to remember, these are just dumb bots. I don't know how they're talking about it, AI. I wouldn't say it's self-aware or sentient. It's just dumb bots. And I think some people get caught with that, and they, they say, oh, look, we're getting banned. I think some of the YouTubers, too, they'll play it up. They'll play it up for views. You know? Uh, Lulu is asking, is Skomo behind this RBA man? No, I don't think he is. Um, Crunchy is talking about Pornhub. Now, I actually went and looked at the possibility of hosting content on Pornhub, and I downloaded their film production guide. And uh, it is, let's say, tailored specifically for their audience. It is tailored specifically for their audience and like how to light up your body parts and different things. Uh, I, I was a little taken aback. I was quite interested, actually, you know, learning about lighting. Um, but I don't think political content will be the best on that platform. I think, you know, it's got a, a, a content on there. But yeah. Hub thinks the streaming site is blocked, perhaps. Perhaps. I know Trigger Warning asked me what my BitChute channel is. Uh, it should be up there. Hang on, I'll bring it up for you. It's just high as it says. There you go. I've been on there for one year, eight months. There you go. High as it says. So I generally put all the stuff up there too. You become a film producer. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Didn't become a film producer, but I was actually thinking of putting these videos up, looking at different content sources, like Coco. That was another one that I was looking at getting up. Uh, there's a few others, but yeah. It was just <laughs> interesting. Because um, let's just say I'm happily married, so I don't frequent any of those sites, so I didn't have any idea. Maybe I'm showing my, uh, my naivete. Oh, we've got a viewer on Twitch. How are you going? Welcome. So yeah, you can check out my uh, bit shoot if you want. Crunchy's asking, is there more info on flammable cladding? I'll let you know if I hear more, but it's going to be a slow process. What comes out? It'll be interesting to see this this last few court cases. Um. I mean, we've we've contacted a client about this uh, 
this decking, the PVC wood composite that's been clad on stuff to look at. We're using it in decking, even just potentially removing it there, which I still think would be fit for purpose. But the main issue was this latest flammable cladding was because it was moving fire from one compartment to another. That was the problem. Yeah, see all your all your stuff using um, the word porn prone is being blocked, guys. None of it's coming in the comments. And I can't be bothered live in it. You think you saw me in one poll? It's probably my my uh, double ganger. My double ganger. There may be more tip off tip offs. Yes. Pub. Um, yeah. I've got a I've got a follow up that freedom of information request. I need some more information for it. That last one. Well guys, I am about to run out of rum. And I know you're all playing with the filter here on YouTube, but you might get in uh, in trouble with your comments. <laughs> So, Prawn Hub. So guys, thank you for joining me for tonight's live stream. Hope you had a great time. And I will see you tomorrow. Are there any other last minute questions before I sign off for the night? I'm out of rum. <laughs> Lulu wants us to be good sheeple. That's what the RBA wants. Yep. Will I skull, skull a schooner? Oh, maybe for New Year's. Maybe I'll do that on New Year's Eve. What do you reckon? Thanks, Crunchy. Take care. Huey forever. Depends how long you're thinking, Clean. Depends how long you're thinking. I think it'll be painful. I think it'll be painful to start with. Who killed Epstein? I don't know. Who was who was paid the most? Will we ever know? How long is a piece of string? As long as the bit you cut it with. So good night, everyone. Have a great time. Thanks for joining me. Good night, DP. And I will see you all next time. Bye for now, guys.